If you're wondering how to make your next virtual event not completely suck, this is the video for you. Hello everyone, my name is Blythe Brumleaf of digitaldispatch.io and like many of you, I have been forced to work from home and network and communicate remotely. Now while I'm a big fan of working from home, I'm also a fan of human interaction and conferences and networking events. So when all of the conferences that I had been planning on attending for this year all got canceled, it sort of left a big hole in my heart. But then the concept of virtual meetings and conferences started booming, especially with Zoom and their crazy backgrounds, which are kind of already old at this moment. The only problem is, is a lot of these virtual events kind of suck. Some were a little too casual, some were a little too structured, some were just not my cup of tea. And that's probably falls a lot on my, on my shoulders for not picking out the right events to go to or attend virtually attend, but I, I still wanted to give these events a chance. And I think the biggest missing piece of that puzzle of all of the past virtual events that I've attended is that they're missing that human connection, that human interaction, that true human interaction, not just looking at someone on a video call and chatting with them, but finding out common solutions, finding out resonating with common problems, things like that, that really make a conference and that in-person networking really, really click. Enter Freight Waves Live at Home, the first virtual event that I've attended that did not suck. In fact, it exceeded my expectations. Now this was an originally planned for a big live event. If you've ever been to one of the Freight Waves conferences, you know that they put on one hell of a show and they do it over the course of several days in various cities all over the country. They were planning for this year for this one to happen in Atlanta, I believe, and for obvious reasons, they had to go ahead and cancel it. But instead of just canceling the entire thing, they chose to make it virtual, hence the name Freight Waves Live at Home. Now this event attracts I think the last one attracted like 1,100 people. They were expecting close to 2,000, maybe 3,000 people at this at this upcoming event. But instead, with the virtual event, I'm going to read off a few stats here because after their three-day virtual event in early May, Emily Zink, who I hope I'm saying that last name right. I'm sorry if I'm not. She's in charge of all the content that Freight Waves puts out. And she just released a graphic after the event was over that said nearly 91,000 thousand people watch their stream at some point over the course of three days and more than five million minutes of content were watched those are huge numbers not to mention the 2000 or nearly 2000 members that were able to join the dedicated but private slack channel that they had going alongside with the conference so that people could communicate with each other while the conference is going on these are all incredible numbers. So the next big question is, well, how did they do this? Well, Freight Waves already is a media powerhouse. They have the broadcasting equipment. They have the, the, the talent that's on staff. They have the talent that's on camera. They have a lot of the big pieces of the puzzle already there for them. They are a media company that also provides software solutions. So in addition to that, they have all of these capabilities right within their own office space with a lot of people working from home in this same technological capacity, I guess is how I can call it. This isn't a simple, you know, sort of phone setup and, and microphone setup like what I have in my office. It's not a simple thing. This is thousands and thousands of dollars of equipment uh, that a lot of companies probably wouldn't be able to replicate. I can probably only a handful of companies probably could, but I wanted to sort of have this video be centered around, I, I participated in all three days of the Freight Waves Live conference, including the, the Slack channel, but I wanted to pull away a few of the takeaways in hopes that it will help you in planning your next virtual event, your next virtual meetup, whatever the hell you gotta do virtually until things get back to whatever this new normal, quote unquote normal is going to be. Whatever you do to get there, this is going to help you ease that burden and make a an eventful conference conference virtually that people will actually enjoy and actually like, but it's going to require a little bit of legwork on your end. Now, a few of the key points that I thought were fabulous over the, over the three days that this conference was going on is number one, several speakers and vendors demoed and they planned for each day 
with either a pre-recorded video or a live video. Now, if uh, somebody was going live, they had questions and answers being taken from the Slack community, from their LinkedIn channels. This is where Freight Waves was broadcasting the event out. They had it on their website. They had it on LinkedIn. I believe they also had it on their YouTube channel, but they were taking questions from those platforms, from the Slack community, and then asking the speakers live on air to get their response. So that was one really cool Cool thing that I thought was really great that could be implemented by a variety of different uh, for really for anybody who's going to be planning on doing a virtual event in the future so that was a really big one and instant reactions to the programming from their in-house programming. So Freight Waves, they have a variety of not only TV shows, but also audio shows, so podcasts and, and TV broadcasts. So they have all of these programming at their fingertips. So what I thought was really great is that they would have all of their normal sort of, you know, conference agenda type stuff, you know, with speakers and events and things like that. But then they would have breakaway sessions where their live show in-house programming team were reacting to the previous program that we all just saw. So it was a really great sort of like a community effort that you could get these live instant reactions from the viewers via the Slack channel. You could also watch the entire event on demand or live. And then after that, they had their in-house programming that was able to sort of break it down almost like a football game like it was really like you're watching the game live with everybody and then you can comment on twitter that's sort of you know how you know a lot of sports people like will usually watch a game is that you'll have the game on TV, you'll have Twitter popped up, and then a lot of people will go live after the game is over. And in this instance, after the conference is over in order to talk about everything that they just saw and all of the information that they got to digest. Using in-house programming probably isn't going to be the, the, the path to success for a lot of companies out there, but it is. it was a really great component to this particular conference or this particular virtual meetup. I don't even know what we're calling these things. Any it felt like a conference, it, it, so I'm just gonna keep continuing calling it a conference. And then there was also one of my really, probably my favorite piece of the puzzle is they had virtual happy hours and virtual lunches. And now I know that for a lot of people that are sort of suffering from Zoom fatigue right now, which I'm certainly one of them, I don't think that everything needs to be a damn video call. On the flip side, when you're at a conference, you're kind of prepared to be like at a work day. This was like my first sort of few days. These three over these course of these three days, it felt like a normal quote unquote work day for me. So to be able to hop on to a virtual lunch, to be able to hop on to a virtual happy hour just felt natural. And so that was a really great component to these these three days is that you had these virtual happy hours that were had a sponsor. So a sponsor in the logistics space, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of who actually sponsored, I'm sorry, uh, but they sponsored the happy hour and it was the same sort of community vibe. But then during the Zoom virtual lunches sponsored by, not really sponsored, it was actually put on by Hubtech. So shout out to Hubtech for putting on uh, these great meetups where it was only like 10 or 15 people and you'd be in a virtual happy hour and the way that it was structured with these, not necessarily happy hour, I don't think anybody was drinking, uh, maybe, uh, to each their own, I was eating. Um, and there were a few other people that were eating. Um, so we were taking our lunch break seriously. Uh, but it was also a very structured format to where we kicked off the virtual lunch with a set of questions and it was questions directly related to what we just saw. So it was almost like our own quote unquote in-house programming. So I thought that that was great. It really helped the conversation get started because that was one of the bigger issues with previous events that I've gone on is that we had these like Zoom breakout sessions or these Zoom, you know, sort of group settings where there's either a bunch of people talking or there's nobody talking and it's almost kind of awkward. Like, what do you talk about? You're like, you're just, you're video chatting with somebody you don't know. So it, it having the that structured layout of, of questions directly related to not only just the conference content itself, but also just the overall feeling of how we liked the conference so far. Is this something that we think that would continue in the future? And then we would all sort of just bounce ideas off of each other and share different perspectives that we had. And I thought that that was really 
really great. They also kept it pretty short too, so you could actually like get up and take a break from the day, from from the the conference knowledge, all the stuff that you were learning from the day. So I thought that the virtual happy hours and the virtual lunch was a super like I, that probably was my favorite part of the entire like freight waves three-day event was taking part in those sort of smaller setup that's where the human interaction really came from because the slack channel was great but there were times when it almost got like a little too salesy i think they 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 toned it down a little bit but it there were those moments where it felt like okay like now is not really the time to pitch your product um people probably don't want to check out your website right now so maybe just hold off a little bit provide ad conversation add something of value to the conversation and then somebody might want to know more about you where you work your product things like that it wasn't too bad but on the first day it was a little bit like a wild wild west but i think people sort of settled into the natural groove of things and then from then it was really really like sort of smooth sailing but I will say that even though a lot of us were connecting through Slack, we were connecting through LinkedIn, I think my profile views jumped more than a thousand percent on my profile views from the previous week simply based off of this conference. And that is exactly what you want out of a conference. But I think it also, it's sort of, I would say one of the 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 down the downside for me is that it almost felt a little too structured. Like the, the conference, the, the breakout sessions, the virtual happy hours, things like that. Like that can feel almost a little too structured because then you don't have room to make those casual conversations. Like uh, what's your favorite sports team? Um, what's your favorite movie that you've seen recently? And you can have those kind of connections with people that are outside of your actual, you know, just what you do is for work. So that helps you. I, I think having those conversations help you connect with people on a different level to where if you can connect with people on multiple different levels I think that that's more beneficial than just you know this is my job and this is what I can do to help you and how can you help me oh great let's continue moving on to the next you know topic of choice so I think that that was just a little bit of a con but that's also that's the nature of the industry of where we're in right now if you want to be able to attend a virtual event you have to do it virtually which duh makes sense I did also hear a couple of other comments that Slack was a little bit difficult to navigate. And I think with that particular complaint, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt because this is the industry that we're in. The industry that we're in is a little slow to adopt new technology. There has been a huge technology boom over the past couple of years, but you're still dealing with those legacy employees who have been in the game for 20, 30 years and they see all this tech and it's honestly, it's over overwhelming for them and and I'll be honest the first time I ever used slack I was overwhelmed I was like what the f what do I need another platform for what do I need another communication platform when I can just email when I can just text any other form of communication but it, what I really loved about Slack and the way that FreightWave set it up is that not only did they have a main feed for all the communication, they had separate feeds for their sponsors, for their vendors, for uh, for their different shows. So they had all of these little breakout groups and then users within that group can make their own private group. So if you happen to, I guess, hit it off with a few different people and like you guys are going back and forth conversation wise, you could start your own channel within Slack and then continue that private conversation. Uh, that's one piece that I really did like. And then there was also a component where they had a LinkedIn channel where you could go in and you could share your profile link to LinkedIn on that particular channel. So you're not spamming the entire, you know, main feed with your LinkedIn and requests to connect over and over again, which would probably have gotten really annoying. But luckily I had the dedicated channel. So everybody just put their profile there. And like I said, the benefit, an overwhelming benefit of going to a conference is getting that human interaction, getting those connections. And we were able to make those connections and we did it in a virtual way, but overall, it was a very fun event. It was much needed as far as in the business world. I think I can speak for a lot of people when I say that it, it was it was refreshing to be part of an event that you feel like could be replicated in the future. Now, that replication is probably going to be difficult to, to maintain at the freight waves level because they got the money to pay for it and they got the equipment and they got the talent and they, they, they check all the boxes. And so they put together a first class 
class virtual event that felt as close to a real conference as you possibly could. Now, for a lot of other companies, that's not gonna be so easily obtainable, but I wanted to put together a few little key takeaways that I think would help you in planning your virtual event so it doesn't suck. So you're not having people scratching their heads wondering why they even signed up to begin with. So let's get into a few different takeaways that I think would really, really help. First, you need to secure a content plan. And if you've been, if you're new to my channel, if you have not watched the video on planning for your content, you need to pause this show go watch or listen to that particular show because that is going to help you tremendously, not just in blogging, not just in video production, not in, in podcasting, but it will help you in your event planning all together. So you need to make a content plan. You need to figure out who am I trying to target and why? What kind of problems do they have that I can help solve? And if I can't help solve them, can I secure somebody who's a leader in the industry within that particular topic that they can come in and they can help my audience? Because the more value you provide to your audience, the more people that are likely going to sign up and attend your event. The next one is plan for these smaller group breakout sessions. And don't just plan for them, but give them topic ideas. The one thing that really stuck out to me was at for Hubtech, their virtual breakout sessions, they had questions ready to go immediately. Once you join the call, they were putting up a, a poll that asked several different questions and then they would put up the results of that poll and then people would discuss. This allowed for a greater flexibility of conversation. You knew what you were going to be talking about before you even entered into the breakout session and you knew what your opinion was because you just voted on the poll. Now you can see the reactions and you guys can have your own little private in-house programming that reacts live to the topics that were just presented that you guys are about to discuss or maybe perhaps you discuss them during your event. So plan for those breakout sessions, but also plan to have them somewhat structured so that people don't feel like they're wasting their time. I also want to share that there was a great thread from the CMO of Podia. And if you don't know what Podia is, Podia is like an online learning system. It's like they have classes and courses and all kinds of stuff. Um, but their job is to help educate. So the overwhelming majority of their workforce works remotely and they wanted to plan a company retreat. Now, normally, I believe these retreats are planned at like a, you know, a specific destination where all of their employees are flown in and they can do this a lot of this brainstorming in person. But I'll share a link to this thread in the comments, um, just my, or not the comments, but I'll share them in you know the, the description box or on the blog post recap, just in the show notes. Check the show notes, they'll be there. Uh, but there was a great thread on from the CMO that of what made this virtual event really, re, or virtual retreat really, really great. And I think the overwhelming takeaway is that they had structured content that they would assign to their virtual retreat members and then they would have a few hours, so they would have a, a couple dedicated hours where they would talk about this structured content, and then they would have a few hours of, of a break time. So they would give their employees time to take a break, decompress, brainstorm a little bit more, because that's really where a lot of the magic happens is you gotta be able to throw some lines out into the water, and then you gotta be able to give yourself and give your people some time to breathe and to think about it and to really brainstorm some great solutions on it and while you can do great brainstorming you know together virtually in person whatever the hell you got to do you can also do even better brainstorming when you just have time to process what you just talked about so I thought that that was great on on this particular thread of how they broke up their sessions so they had you know sort of like heavy-duty you know brain activity uh, for a couple hours with everybody together then they gave their employees a few hours of break time before they had their next schedule event that was my big takeaway from that thread but there was a lot of really helpful information to it and I'll make sure to link to it in the show notes now next you have to figure out the technical aspect of how you're going to be broadcasting your message out to this audience you know everybody knows about zoom but these other platforms I think will be much more beneficial to not just the overall company vibe, but just the longevity of how you plan to create content in the future. Because like it or not, virtual events are here to stay and you need to be able to make sure that you're prepared, not only for now, but for years in the future with the proper equipment 
that it doesn't necessarily break the bank, but it is going to require a little bit of investment. Luckily, I've got some options for you that I've personally used in the past, and then also options that have just recently popped up because there's a demand for it. And when there's a demand, people are going to deliver. So the first one I wanna talk about is, um, many of you who have been streaming in the past, you know about Ustream, or you probably know about Ustream. Well, they got bought out, I didn't know this until just recently, uh, but they got bought out by IBM. IBM Video Streaming is one of the options that I found, and I, I picked Ustream because Ustream is one of the options that will, if you are going to go live, they are a platform that you can plug your phone into, your normal iPhone, I don't know if it works with you Android users, so don't quote me on that, but for you iPhone users out there, it, Ustream plugs directly connects right into it, and then from there you can broadcast to all of the different live streaming programs for, not for free, but all at the same time. It was a very affordable pricing. Now it's about 100 bucks a month because, you know, IBM, corporate life, corporate prices, uh, but with that, you'll be able to broadcast to Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, um, I think even Periscope, basically anyone that has uh, the availability for what's called an RTMP stream, I think is what it's called. Uh, don't quote me on that, but it's basically a link that you connect your external third party source to. So your third party is your LinkedIn, your Facebook, um, whoever else you wanna live stream to, even Twitch, um, platforms like that. But Ustream allowed you to broadcast to all of those platforms at the same time as if it's an original broadcast that's coming from directly from that, I guess, provider. Uh, I've used them in the past and loved it. Uh, it was a lean, it required a little bit of a tech setup. There are a few little tech headaches, but with IBM buying them out, maybe they fixed a lot of those tech headaches. The next one though I wanna bring up is called iBreakthrough. I believe that they are relatively new to the scene, but they specialize in taking a conference and putting it online. Uh, those were one of the companies that were brought to my attention during the Freight Waves conference, and apparently they have some really good solutions. I personally haven't tried it, uh, but it does look promising. So if you wanted to try out that platform, they have some demo videos on their website that you can check out. It's called iBreakthrough. But the next one I wanna talk about is one that I have personally used. I used it during my radio broadcasting days uh, when we had a normal setup as a normal radio show would do with a bunch of mics and people sitting around and talking into a microphone. Only for me, I wanted to take that same show and put the live video feed out to YouTube, out to Facebook, out to Periscope, all of these different platforms. And what I used for that was a program called Switcher Studios. Now Switcher Studios, I think they're only maybe a handful of years old, but it's a fantastic program. It's affordable, it's pretty tech friendly. You, you got it. I mean, you can't be a dinosaur out here and you gotta be able to work an iPhone Let's just put it that way. You can work an iPhone, you can work Switcher Studios. Um, but they are a great platform and, and what I like to call was almost like a command center. So with the command center, what I would do is I would have my iPad and I would put my iPad on the desk and or on the table whenever we were recording live and I would use that as my command center. And then I would have two other cell phones, that one that were pointed at me and my host, me or me and my co-host, and then the other phone was pointed at the other two co-hosts. So we had multiple camera angles and we had it on the master, you know, sort of dashboard. So I use my iPad as the master dashboard and I can switch between cameras. I can also add graphics, like that lower third graphic of what you see on like news broadcasts and things like that. Um, the lower third graphic is is industry slang, but they also, it's it, that's where, think of it as like almost like a graphic box where you can put someone's name, you can put their job title, um, their company name, uh, social media handles, things like that. You can pre-make those graphics, load them up into your little battle state into your iPad, have those graphics ready to go, and then that way while the radio show or whatever show is going on, you can use the switcher dashboard on a separate on your iPad, and then you can switch between cameras from who's talking, you can add different graphics, uh, you can turn the volume all the way down. It's a really, really great platform that I could not recommend enough. That was one of the programs that I really, I sort of miss using now that it's just me and I just need, you know, just a regular phone setup. I don't necessarily need all the bells and whistles anymore, but that Switcher Studios, if you are looking to do a professional 
broadcast and to have it live streamed out to a variety of different platforms and to have it look good, Switcher Studios is the one that you want to do. Uh, they also have the ability to uh, show graphics. So if you have a photo or something of what you're talking about, maybe you have a, a presentation deck, um, something like that, you can load it up into your files and you can broadcast those and all at the click of a button. So Switcher Studios, I could not speak more highly of them. The customer service is fantastic. It's an affordable price point. I want to say they're around maybe 300 bucks a year, which would save you a ton of cash. I mean, it, it really is like I, they're not paying me to say this. They probably should, but they're not. But this is it's a great, great platform that if, if I was running a virtual event tomorrow or even in the near future, Switcher Studios is probably what I would use. And I would set up my entire conference with Switcher Studios and then have it ready to go. So then that way I could communicate through the phone, through a video call, through an, and well, you won't really see pictures on audio, but you could record your audio at the same time and offer the presentation or offer the graphics, um, your B-roll stuff, things like that. You can offer it up um, in your show notes. But if, for more of like the video people, Switcher Studios is the way to go. Uh, it will take some planning in the process. And also uh, from a technical aspect, you wanna make sure you test everything front ways, sideways, backwards, whatever way you want to make sure that you're testing. I can't tell you how many times I freaked out before a radio show because I couldn't, I didn't have something set up correctly. The Wi-Fi wasn't set up correctly or, or something along those lines that I had a mild panic attack, but ultimately just, you know, got it resolved and got the show back live. Those things will happen. You have to plan for them. And you also have to plan for if your signal just cuts out completely. What are you going to do? You have to have a backup plan in order to to, to help out the people who have, maybe they're paying money to watch your e virtual event, or maybe they're just joining because they're interested in your product. Either way, you have to have a backup plan and you only know what you need in your backup plan when you do your testing. So once you test your program, come up with the content, figure out how you're going to interview guests, how you're gonna add guests on, all of those little details, and then you have to do your test runs with the software and you have to do it several times over and over and over again before you actually go live. Because the, the, the thing with running virtual events, relying on tech, you really, really gotta know your stuff, you gotta know your content first, and then you gotta be able to troubleshoot on the fly because with a lot of these things, a lot of your technical glitches, they're going to come at the worst possible moment and you need to know how to fix it and you need to know how to fix it quick or you need to have a team that's going to fix it for you and maybe you can continue to record live but a lot of us we don't have big budgets we don't have a team of you know broadcast experienced people we have to figure it out on our own and uh, you only really figure it out on your own when you do the testing but it can be done because with a lot of these things too you really have to get your reps in. It's like recording podcasts or, or recording videos. The only way you're gonna get better is by getting the reps in. And with virtual events, if you're interested in running your own, if you're interested in starting your own, then you need to get your, your you need to, you know, what is it they say? Dot your I's and cross your T's. I wanted to make sure I said that correctly. You know, quarantine brain and all. Now, with all that said, just know there's gonna be glitches and it's gonna be okay. You're gonna get past it and you're gonna get better, but you still need to get your reps. Business still needs to move forward. You still need to get these sales through the door. You have to continue pushing. You have to keep pushing those boundaries. You have to keep moving forward and continue to, to learn more skills. That, that, that's the world that we live in, whether you like it or not, you have to learn these new software skills. You don't have to buy all the software. Go watch that video. I'll link to it in the show notes. Don't buy all that fancy software yet until you figure out what you really need. Um, develop your processes first, develop your content plan first, and then figure out how software fits into those little gaps. So, whew, that was a lot. Uh, but I hope that a lot of you will take this as encouragement, as confidence to go into your next virtual event or go into your next planning session for your virtual event to know that it it's not going to be the same as going to an in-person conference. We all know that, but there's still equally, I would say there's still a, a, enough benefit to it to not completely ignore it. So if you are thinking about putting on a virtual event, if you're thinking about attending a virtual event, 
do all the things. Try them out and then try to do it yourself. Try to make it better and try to make your product better by learning these new tools and then by introducing them into your own workflows and into your own events. And hopefully, you'll find a bit of luck doing it and you'll find some business doing it because that's really, you know, that's why we're doing it. We're trying to get good business. We're trying to make good connections. That's the point of all this. So I hope this video, I hope you found it informative. For more content like this, hit up digitaldispatch.io. I'm going to be making a lot more of this content here in the future and I'm along with some important announcements coming up soon. So I hope you'll tune in. I hope you'll subscribe to your channel of choice. And until next time, my name is Blythe Burnley. Thank you for watching. Oh.